fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. <laughs> Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And uh, one of the, the luminaries in, co in the comic book industry, a man very responsible for the, for the type of conduct or content and the stories that we get today is Alan Moore. For a very long time, he has been outspoken about his, um, his distrust or his dislike for the comic book industry. He retired from comic books in 2018 with his last edition of, uh, what was it, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Not the greatest comic book ever. I think I read the first two issues and checked out of that one. Although recently he did have, what is it, Cinema Purgatorio, which was in an anthology. That's probably like the last great Alan Moore comic that he wrote. And the guy, he hates the comic book business. He still hates it, but he did recently do an interview with Deadline.com, and he talked a little bit about comic books and, and what he thinks about them and comic book movies. And here with me today to talk about that, he's going heel, baby, the big dog. Heel you, the chief, the tribal chief of Thinking Critical, is on the channel once again. How you doing? Oh, I, that was great. Um, I'm doing wonderful. I was going to call you chief. You're the tribal chief. No, you're I'm, the tribal chief. I'm going to, we'll, we'll battle someday so I can get full ownership on that because I'm not going to be <laughs> snake god. <laughs> you don't want to be the snake guy. You don't want to have to go one on one with Alan Moore in the cage for, no, for snake no. god supremacy. Of course, Grant Morrison will probably be in there with you. Those two have been battling it out for, for so long. You know, obviously they started at Vertigo. They were kind of like the, the British invasion of comic books really changed the industry. You know, the likes which, you know, it's it's changed forever because of what they did over Vertigo. Alan Moore, he had a huge part of that, uh, part of that Grant Morrison as well. And uh, so I picked out five quotes from this interview that we're going to talk about dealing with comic books, comic book movies. And uh, so let's get into them, Yule. Yeah. So this is the first one. He's kind of talking about, uh, you know, where the industry has gone. The way that the industry has changed, it's graphic novels now. It's entirely priced for an audience of middle class people. I have nothing against middle class people, but it was meant to be a, mo a medium for middle aged hobbyists. It was meant to be a. It wasn't meant to be a me medium for middle aged hobbyists. It was meant to be a medium for people who haven't got much money. Basically, saying that basically that the industry abandoned children, it became an adult uh, medium, adult form of entertainment. You know, the writing for the trade, the prices that we talk about. Uh, so it's nice to see that. While I don't agree with everything Alan Moore says, you know, he is the snake god himself. I do agree with a lot of what he's saying here, the, the way that the industry has changed. Yeah, the uh, prices are definitely one of the main things I hear on any show I listen to. <laughs> and at the same time, those people are probably shilling something that costs way more than a comic book on the stands these days. <laughs> but yeah, when you go to a comic book store and you're buying three comic books and it's near $20. That's shocking. <laughs> $20 in comics used to be like, you know, maybe that, or even that, mm -hmm. depending on what decade you were buying them. Uh, but you might not have had $20 also. And that's the thing he's kind of saying here. It's not just children. It's, it, it, it doesn't, it's not that comics aren't for middle-aged hobbyists. It's for poor people. <laughs> it's cheap entertainment that anybody can consume we look at it as children's entertainment i think he in the in this interview he's going to talk about that i don't know if you pull that out but you know he talks about the fact that it's children's entertainment but that's kind of ignoring the fact that um this statement right here is about people not being able to afford other things out there and that comic books were for them and it's often it's kids because I had my also, lunch money. I didn't have lunch and I bought a comic book with it. Yeah. And also he's saying that the, the industry went and courted the middle aged hobbyist, the collector, the speculator. That's why every comic book, you know, relaunch has, you know, 40 variant covers. That's not because that's supposed to get you interested in that comic. It's to bring in the collectors, the speculators that are in there as you know that see it almost maybe as a financial investment or a part of their their ongoing complete collection and things like that so they just kind of abandon uh you know the every man it's it's for a very specific niche market and that's why it's contracting year by year because it becomes more and more expensive people are like 
well, I've invested this much in it, but I can't keep going. And, and they step back and there's, there's no one really to replenish the numbers because it, it's gotten too expensive. It's far too narrow, you know, as far as the scope of what they're trying to do. And I think he probably, he nails it right here. Mm -hmm. No, I think he does. I mean, yeah, for sure he does. But I also think that, you know, if we were to pretend that Marvel was being altruistic and not predatory... Or maybe I could say it's not my fault that there are speculators out there or people that have to buy everything because they're insane, <laughs> like me, insane. Um, you know, it, it's just something that they're doing so that you as a hobbyist can buy, you know, that Art Adams cover. <laughs> it's not necessarily as, you know... Uh, evil as we sometimes want to make it out to be no no I, I have no problem with spec well i have some issues with speculators and collectors They're, they should be a part of the of the of the community they are a part of the community but they shouldn't be the main focus of the community sure um i think the in the 80s like the mid 80s when alan moore was really you know chug trugging along and uh grant morrison and all the other guys dc had a push in their little corner box at the bottom of the book, it would say comics aren't just for kids anymore or something like that. And, you know, Green Arrow had mature readers on it. You know, you're not supposed to sell it to people under 17 type thing. And those were great. I mean, I was like, yeah, comics are growing up or I'm growing up with comic books. You know, this what it really was was DC had the very um, <laughs> they had a very uh old kind of feel to them and they were trying to update and the best way to do it was to take advantage of these writers that they had and say hey man we got edgy comics now you want to read them <laughs> so he goes into kind of comic book uh movies and he says i haven't seen a superhero movie since the first tim burton batman film 1989 they have blighted cinema and also blighted culture to a degree several years ago i said i thought it was really worry a really worrying sign that hundreds of thousands of adults were queuing up to see characters that were created 50 years ago to entertain 12 year old boys. He hasn't, if you haven't seen a movie since Batman, obviously, cinema has changed, superhero cinema has certainly changed. Uh, it seems weird to have such a, 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 de a de definite opinion on something he's he literally has no I idea about. I think it's what? weird that he's just trashing something that he, he has not partaken in at all. It you get to a certain age where you don't want to consume a certain type of media anymore. And for me, it was movies also the long form movie, three hour movie, two and a half. There was a time when I was like, Oh, three hour movies would be great. Now I don't want to, I don't 15 minute shorts are great. <laughs> and if you don't power through those, you're never going to get to the other stuff. And I'm sure Alan Moore not only is like that, but with the inclusion of his works being made into movies, there's probably no reason why he ever wants to. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, do you think he watched that Supergirl that uh, destroyed his uh, man who has everything story or whatever that was called? <laughs> the Black Mercy. You know, uh, he, and he doesn't want to watch that League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or uh, From Hell. A terrible movie. You saw From Hell. I did not but <laughs> did not enjoy that one. Yeah. And all these things, I mean, he, he's, he, like you said, man, because of, because of him and other creators, comic books haven't like gotten out of his way or he hasn't got out of their way. And it's kind of like happening in movies now too. There's a Watchmen TV series and there's the movie and he hates it. <laughs> and I can understand, <laughs> you know? Uh, so battling age, and battling, you know, his inclusion in it, I could totally see why he would say, oh, the Tim Burton Batman's the only one I've seen. <laughs> well, that's a very, it's a movie I love. It's from my youth. It's a weird version of the Batman universe. They kind of changed all the origins for everybody but Batman. And certainly Batman Returns is even weirder. And, you know, generally speaking, I don't think the adaptations of Alan Moore's work have all been all that successful. And, I don't really like what the MCU is now. It feels like a watered down version of, of cinema. But you know, when you go back and you watch X Men, X Two, very good movies. The first two movies uh, in the Dark Knight trilogy, excellent movies. Not just comic movies; those those are just really good movies. So I think he's selling the medium and uh, how far comic movies have come 
short, but he wouldn't know that because he hasn't checked him out. Yeah, and, and I mean, come on. You want to see Spider-Man look good once on screen. It's something you always yeah, wanted. Spider-Man even, 2, Sam Raimi is great. Yeah, even if, I, if, I even if I'm 70. I didn't think you could make Doc Ock work. Exactly. You know, I'm just, oh, I'm very interested in just the the visual interpretation on screen. I could, you know, you don't have to be like, oh, 50-year-old dudes wanting to see stuff when they were 12. Hey, man, uh, <laughs> I, I remember my father always saying, oh, you, th- oh, if, if I could be your age again, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> we're always looking to, to get back that little bit of uh, yesterday. And these movies the are kind of that is, way, you know. Nostalgia is beautiful until you go to Facebook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of goes into his, his part to play in this, and he says, it was largely my work that attracted an adult audience. It was the way that the commercial, uh, that it was the way that was commercialized by the comic industry. There were tons of headlines saying that comics had grown up, but other than a couple of particular individual comics, they really had mostly speaking probably about, uh, you know, vertigo. Those would have been your grow, grown up comics, a, a different, kind of a, a new generation of creators taking comic books in a different direction. So he certainly has played a part in these stories and these comics not being written for 12-year-olds. As much as the boom of the 90s and the collapse and where you know the collector market became so important, where they were kind of essentially creating fake, <laughs> scarce comic books with, with new covers and things like that, as much as that part played a part in it, it was his writing, his direction – Watchmen, you know, Saga of the Swamp thing, it, you know, a lot of this works that he did, he certainly drove it in that direction. And a lot of the writers, you can see it nowadays, you know, Tom King wants to be Alan Moore. Yeah. Uh, it was, all right. So it's obviously very problematic, uh, using this word, <laughs> to, oh, no. to not change uh, or only be affected by something. You know, it's one thing to... <laughs> As an artist, it's one thing to um, have influences, but if you can't get your own voice, then it it doesn't really work. And it just seems like what I've seen before. And why wouldn't I just look at the Retread source Retread of material? something that was already yeah. better to begin with. Yeah, and I like that he he's like, he's trying to not claim ownership, you know, obviously. <laughs> well, he, talks uh, he doesn't about, like uh, what's happened. The killing happened. joke. He's like, you know, it was far too violent. I disowned that comic story three months after it was written. I was like, you still wrote it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you're gonna mean... call Mulligan after it's been published and decided it's one of the five best Batman stories of all time. It, well, he doesn't get that choice, you know. After yeah. after you do it, I mean, that's just the way it is. And I mean, I obviously there's regret. And maybe he that is looks, a really violent comic book. It is. Um, I mean, he looks back at it like we do. We say, "Wow, man, we really liked Watchmen. Wow, we really liked Dark Knight Returns. Wow, we really liked uh, Green Arrow." But look at all the things that had to happen to make that that way. And now we've gotten twenty five years of comics, basically. I, I stopped reading Spider-Man for a while when they were doing like this streaking storyline and it was just like everything was trying to be dark and edgy and this person's dying and this person's like... Everybody wants and to it's deconstruct like, the hero. You can't... Marvel, you can't do Vertigo, you know, or what ultimately becomes Vertigo. You can't do this, you know. It's not mm-hmm. good. <laughs> and And that's what we see. And I mean, I like the fact that he can look back at his own work and... Say, oh, I mean, he probably was like, oh, man, this is really probably a mistake that I wrote this <laughs> because apparently he, he really you know, knew what was going to happen. <laughs> well, he, he has acknowledged in other interviews in the past that, you know, Watchmen kind of ruined comic books and he feels bad about it. Here he's kind of talking about like uh, creators. All these characters have been stolen from their original creators. We certainly I agree with him there. All of them. They have a long line of ghosts standing behind them. In the case of Marvel films, Jack Kirby, the Marvel artist and writer. But if you try to make them uh, for the adult world, then I think it kind of, kind of becomes grotesque. But, you know, that, that kind of grotesque that, that's made for the adult world really comes from him. And it emanates from that Alan Moore style where you get the Batman that's really rooted in, in um, you know, the modern world. And we get a the super, Zack Snyder's Superman that's very dour. It's not hopeful. It's it's all kind of a, a much darker tone. And, you know. And they, they did steal from the original creators. There's no way that, that that's what Siegel and Schuster intended when they created Superman. Well, you know, it's funny because, like, 
When Superman restarted with John Byrne, the last two issues of Action and Superman at that time were the Alan Moore story, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. And it's like one of those loving odes to this really great character. And, you know, Kurt Swan draws it and it's really special. And then he does Watchmen. He was supposed to be using, obviously, the Charlton characters, which DC wanted to incorporate in their universe. Blah, 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 blah. And then he makes this story. And then it gets, you know, elevated into snake god-like status <laughs> in in the pantheon of comic books and uh and it changes everything and you know it it just i don't i don't know if i'd say grotesque but i do see what he's saying um it i do feel for him with this i do think that if he doesn't if he never wanted watchmen to be created they probably should have consulted him I do feel bad, you know, that, that something he created got changed and he didn't want that to happen. And certainly it's happened with a lot of the stuff that he's worked on. But, you know, it, it was part of the contract that he did sign. And he did originally want to use DC owned characters for the story. And so he kind of playing that all along, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like, well, why am I complaining if I wanted to use these characters and I was willing to give this away for whatever? You know, plus I'm making all this money over the years doing it, but it starts to get in your, you know, it sticks in your craw. You know, maybe I wanted to make a t-shirt and I had to go and talk to somebody from DC and I hate talking to them in it now, you know, that type of thing. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe he just saw all those buttons and shirts that were out there and didn't get near as much money. And he was like really pissed, <laughs> even though he was making tons of money off it anyway, probably. Um, I, yeah, I, they're Watchmen will never go out of print. Just dude, so if you, DC can keep the rights. Right. I mean, but and then like and then here he's talking about Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and all these other guys that created all these things that are part of companies. And, you know, who knows who, you know, uh who knows who created Blue Devil? Only people like us, maybe, and I don't remember now. It's unfortunately the you know, the comic industry does have a, a dark history of treating some of their most luminary creators like shit once they're no longer valuable to them. You know, Siegel and Schuster, you think about Bill Finger, uh, Steve Ditko was essentially persona non grata after, uh, you know, he became too much for them to deal with. And, uh, you know, Jack Kirby didn't, didn't die a millionaire like he should have been. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's true. I mean, this is the problem with IPs. I mean, what you want to do is, as a fan, you know, you might like these characters, but obviously go and support your creators that you really enjoy, or maybe you just only really like the you know the characters, and then you know maybe pay attention to who actually created them, and if they're still alive, drop a buck their way. See them yeah. at a convention if that's ever possible again. Buy yeah, some original the, artwork, you know that type. The worst of thing. thing when you see like a GoFundMe for a creator that it is. It's the. Oh man. And you know, the thing is, is like usually a GoFundMe for a creator is like two months slash two years way past when they really should yeah. have had it. I'm living and, in a van, you know, we, we lost our home. Oh, I yeah. need this treatment, you know? It's yeah. Always. And, and, it, and it, it, again, it goes back to, you know, these characters are stolen. I mean, obviously when you work for a company, you know what you're doing when you do this. A lot of comics these days, you don't see new characters. You just see a new version of these type of characters so that that person doesn't really have to exhaust uh, their creative energies. Mm -hmm. Sad. Yep. So this last thing, I think he's pretty much off the mark here. He's talking about the, the fallout essentially of uh, the pandemic and COVID-19 and the, 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 the huge financial loss that's going throughout entertainment. And he says, you might hope that the bigger... Interest will find it more difficult to maneuver in this new landscape. I big expensive productions will be harder to make because there's less money. Whereas the smaller independent concerns might find that they are a bit more adapted. These times might be an opportunity for genuinely radical and new voices to come to the fore in the absence of yesteryear. I think, I think he's backwards on this. I don't think that studios, whether, or even, you know, you talk about DC and Marvel, there's no way they're going to take chances right now. They're going to pump all their money all their marketing, they're going to put pump all their best creative into things that are established that they don't think are risk to, to make money. There's there's not really going to be a lot of new things happening. It's going to be retreads of what we've already seen. 
which the comic book industry is already notorious for, but that's what we're going to see in movies as well. And these kind of smaller things are they're going to be out in independent where, you know, I love image, but they have terrible terms for creators. A lot of those creators don't ever really make any money off of those. A lot of these, you know, smaller movies, they're just going to go to Netflix. They're, they're never going to be there for a wide audience. Unless Netflix is the, uh, the number one world thing, <laughs> streaming service. Um, well, they certainly are. <laughs> uh, but that's not lucrative for anybody necessarily. Um, well, and we sure haven't seen that. For uh, Adam Sandler or, you know, uh, sure. Miller, somebody that's established that they want them to make, you know, but, but for like the new guy, you're probably not making a ton of money off Netflix. Yeah. And it, it, it Again, this kind of goes back to the world that he helped create, and then it got, you know, as he would maybe say, bastardized into movie form. And now what we're seeing is creators that are writing comics so that they can now become movies or TV shows. Or maybe that person was a screenwriter and couldn't make a foot in, footway in Hollywood, so they got this artist or worked with this company and now here we are seeing it on Netflix like it was always intended. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's Boom, what does Boom Studios really want to green light? Something that's a proof of concept for a streaming or a movie platform or something that's truly comic booky that could only happen in the comic book realm? Well, I want to go somewhere that, that, that's got the opportunity to, to make even more money because the real money is in other forms of medium. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. It, we're, well, as we said in the last thing, uh, it, it's not lucrative to be a comic book creator. Um, it is always a, a, a for, it should be, and most often, unless you know you have ulterior motives or other avenues that you want to explore, it's a labor of love. You never get paid as much as you should, um, especially if you're an artist. But you know, with the amount of work that Alan Moore puts into a script, he might as well be drawing it also. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, he puts thought and effort and heart, and knows he's not going to get paid near as much of money as he should. And he's going to see all this stuff get you know taken from him, or not. He's not going to own it, and then it's going to be bastardized and filtered through all these other things. And all he did was love this industry. And just get shat on. <laughs> he doesn't love it and, anymore, I can tell you that. Yeah, and he doesn't. And he ended his comic book career, and I'm like, oh, yeah, right. There'll be something adapted or, you know, whatever. But it sounds like he's pretty gung-ho about this it's, movie it's slash too TV bad because series. The influence and the legacy is real. He's a living legend. Yeah. And, um, you know, and he doesn't want the accolades. He doesn't want anything to do with the industry. And I don't blame him. For a lot, you know, I do think there are some sour grapes out there, but I think for the most oh, yeah. part, he does have legitimate concerns. He has legitimate points. Although here on this last one, I, I do think he's off base a little bit. I don't think that there's going to be any risk taking. Money is going to be pumped into established IPs, established movies, agree. established comic books. I mean, because DC nobody has wants to risk anything with money. DC right now. and their HBO Max thing. They have years and years of all sorts of stuff that they own, Vertigo or not. That would make perfect tel perfect television stuff, um, and <laughs> they can easily or 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 if you don't want to do it, they can just take little bits and pieces and incorporate them in something else, and they can do that mix and match forever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's think about uh, we got we got Planet Hulk in Thor Ragnarok, sort of. Yeah, exactly. That's the oh man, could you imagine like Planet Hulk for real? Dude, it'd be amazing. But then they just went and just throw, threw it in a Thor movie, and it's like, well, they oh. had to because of w the way that they're like their rights don't, are. They can't make a solo Hulk movie don't without you sharing the this. profits with another studio who owns oh. those rights. But they can include Hulk in team books or I like see. in another movie. Oh. It's in there. Then then that's when the the that's when people decry. Oh, Disney! Why can't they just own everything? Why do they have to pay off? And then. You know, you're like, what are you it, saying? So <laughs> don't don't say Hulk, that. Which I believe is the second MCU movie after Iron Man. You know, obviously that Marvel Studios didn't exist then. You know, Disney had yeah, created it. But uh, I did not. It's all the weird, all the weird agreements out there. But you know, I thought it was an interesting interview. Obviously, there will be a link in the video description if you want to go read it for yourself. He goes into way more than this in, in the, some of his other projects. This is just kind of his, you know, movies or his comic book stuff, comic book movie movie things that he was talking about. Uh, Yule, is there anything else that you need to say before we wrap this up? 
I'm a real big Alan Moore fan. I have not read every single thing he's done, but man, he... I, the only thing I have, I really take umbrage to is that, you know, I understand he was writing for an adult audience, but I was a kid becoming an adult as I was reading these things. And I did like the direction that comics went as far as that was concerned. But obviously when it's not applied correctly, it's not going to work. And uh, again, obviously, you know, there's going to be people that are just going to be retreads of the him. You know, read the source material. I check. I would. Ex, I would highly recommend you check his work out. It's very good. Yeah. Don't read Rorschach. Read one. <laughs> yeah. Don't read Rorschach. So uh, I do want to say, though. if you enjoy Yule, he's got his own YouTube channel. There is a link in the video description. There's also an icon on the channel right now. You can go select that and uh, subscribe that way. Yule's a great guy. Great guy. He's a heel, and he is the tribal chief of Thing Creator. <laughs> well, thank you very much.